the nature of, uh, of this mystery of the cross. And I'm taking this from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. He says, above all, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not by the wisdom of language, which would make the cross of Christ pointless. Okay? So what he's, he's saying here, first of all, not by the wisdom of language. Remember when I talked about him going to Athens? That's where he spoke with the wisdom of knowledge, and it didn't work. And somehow, when he was in Corinth licking his wounds, that worked. And so he came to understand that this, this uh, cross of Jesus is tied to the proclamation of the gospel. I mentioned about uh, Mother Teresa and what she'd done and how powerful her ministry had, had been while she didn't preach. But again, those of you who saw the movie last night, I think the most powerful preaching in the movie was that little boy. And he never preached once, you know? But this whole thing of this ability, there's, there's just a remarkable thing about how God uses difficulty. And we need to understand that that kind of difficulty or that kind of suffering is not by accident or peripheral to the gospel. It is the gospel. And in my life, even the way things go, you know, the good, bad, the different, this sort of thing, ultimately the proclamation of the gospel in my life will always be how I deal with suffering, period. And if you've ever thought about it, that's the one thing we really have to offer the world. The world can tell you how to enjoy money. The world can tell you how to enjoy fame. The world can tell you how to enjoy power. They can go through all kinds of this sort of thing. But we are the only group on the face of the earth that knows how to use difficulty positively. We are the only ones who do it. You know, most priests, it's uh, an interesting thing to listen to priests talk together. You're lucky you don't have to do this. But uh, when priests gather, we oftentimes talk about what we enjoy doing. And I have yet to meet a priest whose favorite work isn't funerals. We don't like weddings because of the endless preparation and things that go on and because of what we've seen a lot in our life. I, I think you know the wedding ceremony ends with the, this thing about uh, uh, go in peace, you know, this sort of thing. I always believe the wedding ceremony should end with goodbye and good luck, you know. <laughs> but the, uh, the, you know, the, this sort of thing. But the reason priests really like funerals, it's a fantastic thing whenever I go to large gatherings of people anywhere with any kind of background, the only one who has anything to say about death is a religious person. Everyone talks about, you know, the good that you do in your life is over when you die. Not for us. The rewards that go on in your life, you can't be rewarded anymore after you die. Baloney. And if you're talking death, we are the masters of that world. And that's something for us to understand in all of this. When we see the, the reason why suffering can have meaning for us is that suffering is a, a step, not an end. But in many people's lives, like you could look at that little boy and say, you know, about the, the suffering and everything that went on. And I, I don't know about your background or anything, but the parish I have in Spreckles uh, is, was in the process just before I left of getting a relic of that little tiny boy because we had no relics at the uh, at St. Joseph's Church. And so they were going to get a relic of this little boy for the church. And as a result of that, I was very fascinated with the process of canonization and the ceremony involved in the canonization. And I, you know, we, we sometimes really miss what it is and the power that we have as a community. I give you another example. I went to Auschwitz when I was in Germany 
And I had a young couple, friends of mine, who I just happened to meet there in Germany. I didn't know they were there on vacation too. But his wife is Jewish and uh, the young man is Catholic. And they've raised their children Catholic and everything. But anyway, they're going through Auschwitz. And before we went there, she was talking to me about how terrified and everything she was. And I told her, as a Jew, you should walk through Auschwitz with your head held high because you're proof your community survived it. You are absolute proof that your community survived it. And no person wearing a Nazi uniform would dare step into Auschwitz today. They would be ripped to shreds. But you as a Jew can walk through it. And so you need to, and that's the way we should feel as believers, you know, with the persecution that went on in Mexico, once it's all over, um, uh, well, I don't know whether you know this from the movie, but I can name a lot of people who died in that. I had the, uh, you know, the other little boy in the film who survived. I did his funeral in San Luis Obispo about 10 years ago. And the, uh, the other people, you can name them, but who can name the people who persecuted them? Who can name the people who attacked them? Why can't we name them? They don't matter. They simply don't matter. And to understand the great power of this cross, there's something about the cross. And when the cross is implanted in our lives, in whatever it is, in a physical difficulty, in aging, in problems, in anything, whatever implants the cross within you bestows power upon you. And know that. Deal with your crosses with great care. That is your weapon for the gospel. And that's true of everyone. I was mentioning at the table, there was an elderly woman in San Luis Obispo, and uh, she went into a rest home, a uh, very elderly woman, and uh, she couldn't get out of bed, and you know, they, they take care of you and this sort of thing. And uh, she saw her ministry was to entertain the staff. So she was always up and excited, and all this sort of thing when a staff member came in her room. And when they weren't, she was saying the rosary all the time. It was a fascinating thing for me. And, and you might just put this in your mind if you want to do it yourself, you ever end up in a rest home. You want to see a lot of the staff entertain the staff because they get so many complaints and so much background. Every time I came there, I had to ask people to leave so I could see her, you know? And how many of those rooms are sitting empty and everything? And she understood, this is not a cross, this is my ministry. And so this is what she did. Incidentally, she converted a couple of people there as well, a couple of older people and one nurse. But this idea of being able to somehow carry the cross, that is the thing. And, um, well, he'll use this in the next one, so I'll go on. He says, the message of the cross is folly uh, for those who are on their way to ruin. But there are those of us who are on the way to salvation. It is the very power of God. And people who do not have the faith we have, suffering is a waste in their life. Like, like if I could take the, the life of, l let me take that little boy in the movie last night, because you saw, if we would take the life of that boy, for a non-believer, once he was captured by the, uh, the, federi feder uh, the federal governments, yeah, but once he was captured, you would actually consider his life over. As a non-believer, it's a wash. Because what's he do? He just suffers and all this sort of thing. But for us as believers, when he's captured by those people, that's when his glory begins. That's when his impact begins. And that's when you discover that is not just a child. That is the very power of God operating through a child. And he proved to be stronger than any of the people who arrested him or tortured him. And why? That's the folly of the cross, and it is our weapon. I would love to be able 
to go back, which you can't do, and go through those different people who dealt with that little boy and find out how many of them were converted in the process. You know, that one of the things that you notice after the death of Jesus, that the first time that Jesus is, uh, the, the apostles are preaching and they recount, they will say, you know, that there's so many people and many of the priests turn to God. The priests are the ones who crucified Jesus. Now, what was there about the death of Jesus that converted them? And it wasn't the resurrection. It was something about the death. That's the mystery of the cross. It is the mystery of the cross. And I think sometimes there are people who have extremely heavy crosses, and there are many of us who have very light crosses. But if I'm a person with a light cross, and I believe I am, but if I'm a person with a very light cross, I can participate in the folly of the cross by the way I care for the person who carries the heavy cross. And as a Christian community, there are many in our community who carry very heavy crosses. And the great thing about being a Christian, if you carry a heavy cross, you should never have to carry it alone. So we as believers, we can participate in the cross through the suffering of another person and through their power than we even can, you know, in our own life with the suffering and that goes on. And that, that forms and builds the cross. He says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and put aside the discernment of the discerning. And, and God ultimately says, that I destroy the wisdom of the wise, but he destroys it with the wisdom of the cross. And the fact is, if you don't have faith, the cross not only doesn't make sense, it cannot. And one of the great difficulties in the society in which we live, and I think you know we're living in a non-believing society. Okay, we live in a non-believing society. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how well your life goes. There are periods of difficulty. And if you don't have faith, there are holes in your life. There's no sense, there's no meaning or anything. If you're a Christian, those not only aren't holes, they are the power moments. They're the power moments in our lives. And, and to understand the wisdom of this world collapses in the face of that. And I, again, I think that the great thing uh, I, I talk a lot about this because I find it fascinating, is the, the number of people that Mother Teresa converted after f completely agreeing that she would never talk religion with anyone. And she didn't. She didn't have to. But this, this idea of, of understanding, it's, I don't know how, power is not a part of us. It's that when you enter the relationship with God, you are power. It's not something you have, it's who you are. And that we want to stand in the presence of God and witness to the faith by who we are and the way we live. And we want to really make that a part of the world. Another thing um, the, to, uh, to go along with it, this, I'd like to, I wanted to spend a little time about looking at this, particularly in the age of COVID because it's the age of COVID that caused us to sort of deal with this topic. I think one of the most important things of being a Christian is to be able to see the positive in any situation. And ultimately, what will be the positive of the whole thing? And just to give you an example, I was uh, listening to a TV program quite a while back and there was a doctor on it from Denmark. And the doctor uh, is part of the World Health Organization. But uh, one of the things he said, I thought was, was just remarkable. He said, you know, 50 years from now, that there won't be a lot of people alive who went through the pandemic. And uh, the few who do won't have a lot of memories about it 50 years from now. 
But he says, do you know 50 years from now, so far in the history of medicine, do you know the two most important days in the entire history of medicine? The discovery of penicillin and the discovery of the vaccine for this virus. Do you realize that this is the first time in the entire history of the world where medicine has ever stopped a pandemic in the middle? You know, we overcame smallpox, but not until all the Native Americans were dead. They overcame the Black Plague, but not until three quarters of Europe was dead. If you look at the plagues historically, the plagues are resolved, but usually several years after the plague has run its course. It is the very first time in history when science has intervened that way. And to understand that's a remarkable thing, and that'll be a very important thing for medicine. And when I was a little boy and studying vaccinations, we knew that you killed the virus and put the virus in you and stuff. That's not the basis for vaccinations anymore. The basis on which Moderna and Pfizer are built has nothing to do with that. It's a whole different way of approaching things that will allow them to approach pandemics in a very different way for the rest of history. In the same way, penicillin allows them to approach infections differently than they ever did in history before penicillin. And so to understand that, the second thing, it, it, one of the most fascinating things about the pandemic for me is the pandemic actually attacked the very basis of our faith because the whole thing of it was separation. You know, symbolically of us in the church separating so far in the seats. But in fact, it brought about separation. And you know, the, the role of the church, the role of a priest is to gather a congregation. It's to gather people and to bring them together. And the living of our faith, you can't very well live your faith without people around you. You know, I'm very good to my dog, I've exercised him, but this is not going to count ultimately. This is not what living my faith is, okay? You have to have people around you. One of the wonderful things that went on in the church, in the area which I am, I don't know how well you noticed it, is the way people began to take care of one another. One of the things that you would find, I think it's still going on in San Luis too, I do a lot of walking, but there are boxes of food, canned food, just set out all over town. And that's largely for the homeless who cannot gather at the homeless shelters now. So the food is out there and they, they put it in all these different areas. I also noticed how people began to take care of one another. I, and it still goes on with me and God's grace, it'll never end. But anyway, almost anyone in the parish who would go to Costco would phone me. I get at least one call from Costco every day. And it's because someone is in Costco and they say, what do you need, Father? And nor my normal answer is, until I decide to open a restaurant, I don't need any more right now, okay? <laughs> one of the interesting things is once you get something from Costco, you're in it for months, okay? <laughs> so. Uh, but they, they tell me, I have no idea even who is calling me, but it'll be on my porch that day. And if it happens to be refrigerated, it'll be on my porch, they're gone, and they'll phone me to tell me it's been set there. And I'm not the only one in the parish this is happening to. People who are really, the people really rallied about very elderly people living alone. And they, they simply would not allow them, like I, I was at, Costco with a friend of mine once uh, recently and there was an elderly lady coming in and the woman at the door who I, I'll say with all pride is a member of our parish but the woman at the door says ma'am give me your name and address and your phone number and tell me what you need but don't come in and so she went back to her car and I presume they got up what she needed and put it at her door so while, in a sense, we were separated, we had amazing opportunities to serve one another. 
And there were people who were really in great need uh, because of compromised situations and stuff. There are lots of people. So while COVID, when I initially saw it, it attacked the very thing we're about, it provided all kinds of opportunities to deal with it. And you and I must always look, you know, at, at the opportunities. I, again, I was telling the people at table that the parish I'm in, the uh, pastor is, I think, very pastoral. I think most pastors are administrators, but he is very pastoral. A, 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 a true pastor always looks ahead. One of the, the things we were taught in the seminary, a shepherd looks where the sheep are going. That's where you always look. So anyway, one of the things is when this began, many churches began to sort of cut back their budgets because they realized there was going to be a drop in collections and stuff like that. This man decided to put up a circus tent on the property. And he has a huge piece of property, so he set up this massive circus tent. This circus tent will seat four times as many people as his church. And now he has too many people to move back in his church. So they're going to try and do the circus tent permanently. They're going to try and raise the land, pave it with astroturf, and then put up a permanent structure that the, uh, what do you call it, the a fire department will allow and, uh, and, and do that. But it's all because he saw COVID as an opportunity, you know? And, and we as believers, remember, we're all about the future. The, the, uh, I'll tell you another thing. I had a wonderful experience when I was in, um, in the Holy Land the very first time. I was there with a, uh, a Jewish tour. I ended up on a Jewish tour by accident. Um, I looked up a tour, and there was this great tour in which it was a three-week tour. And one week, they took you on a tour all over Israel, and then they gave you two weeks in any of four hotels, one in Jerusalem, one in Haifa, one in Tel Aviv, and one in Hebron. And you could switch to the hotels all the time you wanted, but what you did was then go back to see what you wanted to see. And the tour was mainly made for people who had relatives in Israel. Now, I didn't know that, but that looked like an ideal tour. You see the place and then go see what you want to see. So I signed up for it. But one of the things I remember, we were going into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's divided to different uh, of, the East, of the ancient churches, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, Roman Catholic. This, so it's divided all. And as we were going through, the place is a veritable old museum type place as you're going through. And, and the Jews were all saying around that, you know, you see, it's, the Christianity is just amusing, picking on me with regard to this. So I'm listening to this as we're going through. The Catholics are in a separate chapel. So we open the door to the chapel and there's a mass going on, but the mass is for a choir and it's a choir of German schoolboys. And the German schoolboys are there. Now the mass was in English because the priest there was in English. They didn't have a German priest. And so most German songs, you know, have an English version because German translates so easy. I'll give you an example, Silent Night. That's a German song, okay? But anyway, they open the doors and the first line of the chorus you hear 200 schoolboys sing, the future belongs to us. And I was thinking, that's the Catholic Church. The future belongs to us. But you and I need to look at what we do today that affects the future. Don't think of the past, you know, like, like if something happened, like if you get sick with the COVID, the question isn't how you got sick, who cares, you're sick. The question is, what are you going to do with it? How do you deal with being sick? How do you deal with these situations? How do you deal with a relative who dies? The whole thing is the future. And if you watch Jesus in the scripture, that's what he's constantly, listen, listen to his thing. Before Peter denies him, 
before Peter tries to get him away from the uh, uh, dying on the cross, and before Peter, um, uh, what do you call it, before uh, Peter will desert him as they're going to the cross. Before any of those three things, Jesus says to him, I will, as future, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Not now. Not now you're a piece of jelly. But one day on this rock, I will build my church. And I, I think one of the things the professor has told us in the seminary, he says, if you can look at your life now and study you and figure how and why God chose you, you're stupider than you look. The fact of the matter is, why God shows you exists in your future. God was looking at what he could make of you when he called you. He didn't look at what you were. And what we want to do is people who are leaning that way as a community, and people who have no, uh, what do you call it, belief or no faith in the world, can't look that way. The furthest they can look is to the end of their lives, and that's unpredictable. You and I can look into eternity, and that is predictable. We can look clear into eternity and make sense of anything that goes on on the face of the earth. That is called the mystery of the cross. And to the degree we can accept that, and it can become a part of our ministry and everything. And again, I've told you in the lives of saints, martyrs, look, look at the past. Look at what's happened with regards to these people. And look at how, um, like, like if you watched the movie last night, what broke the problems in Mexico was the way the people endured what was going on. They didn't really win the war. The federal government ran out of gas. That's basically what happened. Internationally and locally, they ran out of gas. And we as a community, we do that, you know, Systematically, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting in the, uh, the, the history of the world. One of the professors uh, one time in the, uh, I was actually, it was at Cal Poly. I went over to a lecture on business. I, I, I like, a lot of lectures open at Poly. I like to listen to enough about things that I have nothing to do with just to figure something about them. But anyway, this guy began with a lecture, and the, the, it was a business thing. And he says, you cannot do anything in business unless you understand the Catholic Church. This guy's an atheist. And he said, the reason is, now he's looking from a business model. He says, the largest sequence of CEOs in history is the Roman Catholic Pope. The largest extended thing into different lands and stuff is the Pope. He says, you watch their history, it's oftentimes been very difficult. They have buried every single enemy. And he says, and they survive. He says, they go through difficulty. That's what you want in a business. You want a business that survives whatever is happening. You want a business to survive and you go through this sort of thing. He says, you must understand the Catholic Church for that. But the reason for that is we're focused beyond whatever's going on. So when it's over, no one else is prepared for it, but we are. And I, I see that like when, I, when Vatican II was going on, there are a lot of people in the seminary. I went through the most conservative seminary I'd be willing to bet in the entire world, which was San Diego. We had lectures once a month from the John Birch Society. That's, that's how conservative it was. And then we'd have to sit down and, and discuss it and this sort of thing. When Kennedy died, there was a celebration in the, uh, the seminary because they were against anyone who had any kind of liberal thing and this sort of stuff. But anyway, it, it's hard to imagine how, uh, how conservative they were as a community. And I should mention that um, when I entered the seminary, uh, they had just built a new building, and there were 800 students, 800 students for the priesthood in this building. And uh, 
within 10 years, that building had been closed, and the eight seminarians they had were studying in another diocese for San Diego. And the, the thing is, something like that is focused on today. And what was happening? Vatican II was rushing like a train into tomorrow. And honey, if you weren't on that train, you were left in the dust, period. And that's what happened to the, the seminary, that particular seminary. It was focused on this whole, you know, ancient thing with regards to the church. And the church doesn't do that. And one of the things a professor in the seminary told us, one of the great difficulties of being a Roman Catholic, and you have to know this, is that you are living in a church that doesn't care about you as much as it cares about your children. The church is building the world and your parents had to suffer through a church that was preparing for you, not for them. The ch always this whole thing of the forward push and you and I want to be part of that. That's where the church is moving. And so we want to be part of that. And the church has done it all through history from the very beginning. Most people don't, don't notice it, but you know the most radical move in the early days of the church was switching to Latin. And do you know why they switched to Latin? So they wouldn't have bilingual religious services. What was going on at the time? All the Gentiles spoke Greek, all the Jews spoke Aramaic. So the Aramaic parishes were all in, uh, uh, the Jewish parishes were all in Aramaic, Gentile parishes were all in Greek, and when they worshiped together, it was bilingual. And the experience of most people is no one likes a bilingual service unless you speak both languages. But if you don't speak both languages, it's like half the service is missing for everyone. So what did the church do? The church turned to a language that was regarded in that time in the world as gutter language. When we translated the Bible into it, that's why it's called the Vulgate. They considered that language vulgar, okay? And the whole church was looking ahead. Why would anyone turn to Latin? You know, a hundred years ago, when it, you know, people, you'd think, why not? But I mean, what else was there? But at the time, it was considered a disaster and stupid, okay? And so, as a, as a community, we need to understand we constantly move to the future. And when things are going on, things negative and this sort of thing, you and I do not really need to look at that or be too concerned about it. We want to know where it's going because that's what the church is about. In, in a, ter a terrible persecution like uh, took place under the communists and the Nazis, when I visited Poland, probably the thing that most struck me personally, I never went in a Polish church that didn't have four or five portraits of priests in the vestibule, all of whom were martyrs. That the first people the Germans arrested when they took over Poland were all the teachers. And they regard preachers in churches as teachers. So they virtually uh, took them out. Now, I don't know about uh, what you know about Auschwitz, but a quarter of Auschwitz was for Catholic priests. It was just a whole series of the buildings, one after another. I'll tell you a, a powerful experience I had at Auschwitz. Uh, I took a friend of mine with me who I think generally regards me as crazy, but uh, he's another priest, and we, uh, we went to Auschwitz. My spiritual director in the seminary had been a prisoner in Auschwitz. And uh, he was the rector of the seminary in Budapest when the Nazis took over. And one of the things he told me is he said, or he told the class, he said that in uh, Auschwitz, what the Jews were not most afraid of was dying. It wasn't dying they were most afraid of. They were most afraid that no one would say Kaddish when they died. There's a Jewish prayer over the dead. It's called Kaddish. And most people don't know it. Rabbis know it. But rabbis never even made it into the camp. Every rabbi who was coming in was killed at the door. And so the rab there was no rabbis. They were terrified that no one should say Kaddish for them. So uh, 
he asked each one of us to say Kaddish every Saturday for the rest of our lives for someone who didn't have it said for them in the camp so that we would do it. So I think most of the guys in the seminary did it. But when I knew I was going to Auschwitz, I wanted to say it in the camp. And when you go to Auschwitz, and again, I don't know how much you know about this, but you go through the camp of Auschwitz, which is huge. But right beside Auschwitz is a camp twice the size of Auschwitz that they built because they couldn't kill people fast enough in Auschwitz. And the camp beside it is called Birkenau. And incidentally, Birkenau was for women, and that's where Teresa Benedicta, uh, Edith Stein, was murdered. And Auschwitz is where Maximilian Kolbe was murdered. So anyway, we go through Auschwitz, we get in the bus, and they take us over to um, Birkenau. So uh, we get through Birkenau, and we're supposed to get on the bus again to go back to the, uh, the hotel. And uh, this priest friend of mine and said, hey, come with me. I, I said, what do you mean? And he pointed to a cab. And so we went over, and he, on his cell phone, had made arrangements for a cab that would take us back to Auschwitz and then to the hotel when we were finished. Because he knew I wanted to do this. So he took, and we went in. They don't like you going through Auschwitz on your own. And basically, they want to, and I mean this in a benevolent way, not a mean way. They want to pro uh, propagandize you. They want you to know, understand, you know, not just see a building, but know what went on in there and that sort of stuff. So they take them through in groups. So um, we weren't going to be going through in a group. So we went in and I said, why don't we go over to one of the buildings that was assigned to priests? And it was just the foundation there. And we'll say it there. So we did. And then we did another one and another one and another one. We walked through Auschwitz and went in every single building from the ovens to the offices. And we said the prayer in every single building and never once encountered the hundreds of tours that were going through Auschwitz simultaneously. But after we'd done it in about four buildings, this guy turned to me and he said, you know, I think Jesus wants us to do this. <laughs> so we went through building to building to building, a powerful experience. But to understand that if you, if you look at the, the things about Maximilian Kolbe, Maximilian Kolbe spent his time in Auschwitz trying to figure how to reconstruct his Franciscan community when he got out. He did not get out, but the community that he had has been reestablished on the plan he set up while he was in Auschwitz. And that's what you do. If this is going on, there is some way God can use it. And he will use it through us if you and I make that our plan. So essentially, when we talk about this, of the mystery of the cross, the mystery of the cross is that suffering is power. It is not weakness. Suffering is power. And the way you and I Christians deal with it is that as power, it's aimed at the future. And to the degree we can understand how it can be used, we try and do that. It could be you can't understand the way it's to be used at all. You don't have to do that. Live your Christian life and what you deal will further what God's doing through it. You don't, you know, the, um, I had someone ask me the other day about um, evaluating uh, their ministry in some way. I told them, you have no right to evaluate your ministry. It's none of your business. Your job is to do ministry. God evaluates it. Wait, he'll tell you what it's worth when you're finished. But you do not have any right to evaluate what you're doing. And it would be like, you know, I'll go back again to the movie. I thought that was a powerful movie. But I'll go back again to the movie. If you could have talked to the boy's mother and the four people standing around as the little boy was, you know, shot and thrown in the grave, I'm sure every one of them would see it as a waste and all this kind of thing. 
And if Jesus were standing right there, he would say, you have no ability to judge what's going on here. He says, I judge it, no one else. And that, that is the power of the cross. We enter under the judgment of Jesus Christ. If you look at the life of Jesus, I'll tell you something, the cross makes sense. If you look at the lives of anyone else, a cross doesn't make sense. But we aren't living anyone else's life. We're living Jesus' life. And in this life, that cross is power and nothing else is power. Thank you very much. This is absolutely your last chance for crazy questions. So, go ahead. Oh, interesting. I'd never seen it. Go ahead. They what? Don't reconcile with us. Faith, what we believe in. Uh huh. And I was just curious about your comments, uh, the priest in there, the general priest, and some of the things that go on in war. Because I, it's hard to reconcile what we've done in war. Oh, you mean like the priest in the movie? Uh, you know, I I think it's a matter of recognizing your call. I'll I'll give you a very interesting book if you want to read it. And the book is called Church of Spies. And it is the efforts of Pius XII to assassinate Adolf Hitler. I think you know that once you're a pope, your papers cannot be released until 50 years after your death. But Pius XII papers have been released. And it documents, how many of you saw the movie Volcari? Pius XII, that was one of his plans he put together. But it, it shows you, in, in the situation, the political situation sits beside the religious situation. And it could be that you are called to operate in both. And if you look at the priest, what he was doing was defending people. He was doing it with a gun, but what he was doing was defending people. And if you, if you look at the history of the church, you'll find the Catholics are called both directions. As time goes on, there are priests who are called to be involved with the military, and there are priests who are called not. And that's, yeah, I, I just think that's, that's hearing a call from God. And again, that's why if he were not a priest, you'd see what he did as perfectly all right and everything. So erase the priest thing, because he brought a priestly presence where there wasn't one. And again, the future look at his effect on the atheistic general. Just watch that in the whole thing. To me, that would justify anything he did, anything at all, okay? I, in fact, I found it highly amusing, his concern about God's judgment on him as though he was reaching the end, you know? I could have told him exactly what it was gonna be, but he could find that out from Jesus, you know? But I, th I think in every situation, you have to be very careful People, you know, hear what God calls them to do and they pursue it. And so, so that's what he did. There's, I'll give you another example if you've never heard this before. In the city of, uh, is it Atlanta where the first shots of the Civil War were fired? On the, the island, what is it? Where's that? It's a city. It's a city in the south. But anyway, when the Confederates were getting organized there, there was only one person in the entire town who's graduated from uh, West Point. It was the bishop. So he helped them aim the cannon for the first shot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, well, you know, he was fighting for the South that he thought was being invaded, you know. But anyway, anyone else, they had another hand up, go ahead. Uh-huh. I know it's going on all the time, but I'm thinking of Pope Francis and his efforts to move in one direction, we'll say forward, mm -hmm. and a lot of resistance to pull back. But he just recently kind of jerked back on the regression towards the Latin Mass. Mm-hmm. 
There, there is, uh, there is in the church, a, uh, what do you want to call it, a, and always a resistance to change. And I want you to know the resistance to change is not a negative thing. It's what prevents the church from moving too fast, okay? And what Francis is concerned about, and this is something the church is grappling with right now, but let's say you have a community here and their mass is in Latin. The real question is, is this a community that wants a Latin mass? Then in our church, they're entitled to it. Or is this a priest who's imposing a Latin mass on a community? That's the question. And I think you know that's a very difficult question to figure out. But we would say in, in our tradition, you know that if you have a group of Hispanics, they want mass in Spanish. Because of the vernacular now, you can't very well argue with any person who wants a, lang a mass in a language different than I do it. You know, you can't argue with them. So the people who want the Latin mass, but the key is we don't want the clergy imposing it. And that's what he's concerned about because that was going on in a lot of things. It's like intinction. You know, we're not supposed to use intinction at all. But I'll tell you where intinction started. As soon as they started giving communion in the hand, many priests started using intinction so you couldn't get communion in the hand because you can't put an intincted host in someone's hand. So it was one of their ways. And it, it, you know, priests are tricky people. You have to be very careful. But with, with any kind of law they make, it's part of the game to figure out how to get around it, you know. But anyway, the church, the church believes if you're a group of people who really want to celebrate the thing in Latin, then you're welcome to do that. And I've watched, in, like a lot of people are very worried about, I've watched in San Luis Obispo. We have something wonderful in San Luis Obispo. I was able, when I was pastor, I built a church for the Byzantines and had the Byzantine Catholics come in and open the parish. So they came in and did that. But the nice thing about it is that in this Byzantine church where the services are very traditional, all the Catholics who are really locked into the tradition actually go to the Byzantine church. It's still a Catholic church and they do it, you know, in the vernacular. Because I think what the, a lot of the people with the Latin, they miss the solemnity not the language. It's really the solemnity. And I'll, I'll admit, we will never in my lifetime have hymns, English hymns, as beautiful as the Latin ones we gave up. We just won't, but they will in time. I mean, that's the way they think. Ultimately, we'll have hymns that way. But so I, I think, you know, you, you see this as a part of the church, but understand conservatives actually prevent the church from moving too fast. And I think that's good. I think that's a good process. And liberals always win in the history of the church. Liberals always win, but it's a slower process than anyone wants. I think one of the things that I, I find amusing among Roman Catholics, and I found it particularly in the seminary, because I was in the seminary while Vatican II was going on. The seminary was divided into two groups of seminarians. One group that believed the church was moving so fast it was gonna blow apart and one group that was enraged that the church was so slow with what they were doing. No one was happy. It was a wonderful community, you know, <laughs> that no one was really pleased. And so, and, and, but that's the way the church moves. The church always moves forward. There is no other way to go, but the church tries to move slowly. Go ahead. Sameness. Sameness, it's not the uniformity. Mm, yes, unity is not uniformity. And, and I think the, the Pope John the Twenty Third, when he opened the Vatican Council, one of the things he did that had never been done before was he took the different rites of the Roman Catholic Church and the mass for the, uh, what do you call it, the, for the bishops, 
uh, who were celibate, was of a different right every day. And the first right, and I was really glad it was filmed, because if you ever get a chance to see this opening liturgy, you always want to look at the faces of the bishops. It was the mass of the church in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Catholic Church. And the offertory procession, there are 11 priests who dance down the center aisle with huge plates on their head. And in the plates are the bread and the wine and this sort of thing. And there's dancing, there's singing, there's tambourines. These bishops look like they've been electric shocked, you know? <laughs> but he wanted them to know that this is an ancient tradition of the church because we think the Catholic Church is sameness. And when I was a little boy, I was taught that way. The Mass is said in the same language, exactly the same way, everywhere in the world. Well, the answer to that is everywhere in the Western world. Not Ethiopia, not Morocco, not Russia, you know, not Romania. They all have their own, you know, different thing. But we weren't trained with that, so, I mean, we thought it was exactly the same everywhere. The one thing that united us is none of us could understand the language rather than being in anyone's individual language. Anyone else? You, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious, what is uh, the story of St. Anthony? The story of who? St. Anthony. Anthony. You mean the one after whom this place is named? Sure. Uh, St. Uh, Anthony was uh, one of the very early members of the community. And if you study uh, uh, Francis of Assisi, Francis of Assisi, I think you know, decided not to be a priest and was a deacon, but never became a priest. And one of the things that he was really concerned about at the time, the wealthiest people in the world at the time were educators. And that's because they saw a very high value on education and everything. So Francis did not want any of the monks to be really educated, because he saw that as a thing with regards to money. Well, the unique thing about Anthony is Anthony was such a good preacher that Francis allowed Anthony to go on for his studies, and Anthony became the very first Franciscan to ever teach seminarians, and he taught in the Franciscan seminary. And so that, that's basically the big thing about Anthony. Anthony, is, he's one of the doctors of the church. He was a, a huge scholar, and the first huge scholar in the Franciscans. There are a lot of them now, but he was the first huge scholar. Okay? Go ahead. Who? Oh, what? Well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you kind of touched on the image of suffering, but is that something that's a value in our faith that yeah. we're going through for another person? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, in, in our tradition, the whole idea of suffering, he's speaking of a case of medical suffering, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in, in our tradition is, again, how you deal with it. Now, when I was a little boy, when they talked about how they dealt with it, they were talking about offering it up for the poor souls in purgatory. Okay, so, th so that's what you did. You prayed for the poor souls of purgatory and stuff. Whereas today when we talk about it, we're saying you do the same thing. We're talking about you have to see it as evangelistic. What you're doing is converting and drawing people to the Lord. But it, it, like if you're watching the person, you can't tell whether they're interested in purgatory or evangelizing which I think is probably wonderfully amusing to Jesus, you know, that he's a, I think he does both, you know, this whole thing. So, but I, again, in suffering, even a doctor will tell you this, the key to suffering is how you get through it. And in Roman Catholic tradition, the key to suffering is see it in the future. Where is it going? Not, you know, the thing itself. Someone have another, go ahead. Can you speak on um, all the facets of society that have gone leftist and ex 
extremely progressive with the education, media, entertainment. Mm -hmm. And my fear of like, do you see, or what are your thoughts on that influence entering the church or mm -hmm. realizing that it has entered, mm -hmm. it's infiltrated? Uh, can you just speak on that? Uh, the, the idea was uh, about our society going so liberal, and I would much say loose. And one of the things that has happened historically, and this is true of the United States particularly, if you look at, at the United States, we came out of a Judeo-Christian tradition when the country was founded. So people's morality was founded on law. Like our law said, when I was a little boy, you couldn't open a business before noon on Sunday because you might interfere with people's services. You, I mean, with all the laws, they call them blue laws, but all the laws and everything were Christian. And we watched that sort of evaporate. But one of the things we've discovered is the bulk of people do not have a conscience. The bulk of people relied on the law so the day abortion was legal, everyone thought it was all right, like overnight. Like when I was a youngster, if a doctor performed an abortion, he would go to jail for three months. And at the end of three months, he could never practice medicine again as long as he lived. I mean, it was, it was that strict. But once the law changed, people saw that it wasn't the, you know, the people believe that then it's all right if they change the law. So what we're dealing with right now, and again, I want you to look forward. What we're dealing with right now in the United States is this great liberal movement. But the end result of the liberal movement is that people will have to rely on personal conscience, not the law. And that's good. It's good that you have the law within you. Now, if you study about the, the essence of law, uh, if to give you a picture, um, if I could put your dot here is you, and my dot is me, and what we do is put our rights around one another, and you only have law where our rights intersect. So like you have the right to own a gun, you have the right to pick up the gun, you have a right to point the gun, you have a right to shoot it, unless it's pointed at me. And so, and I have the right to have a gun, shoot it, I just can't point it at you. Because that's where the law hits. And what we're watching now is that as law disappears, people will have to rely more and more on their conscience. And what we're watching is the perishing of law in favor of freedom. But we have not seen the real rise in conscience yet. That's what's coming though. Because you'll have to have some kind of order but the order will no longer be external to you. And that's good. That's really good. It's a process and you and I will not live to see the end of it. So I'd encourage you to buy yourself a flak jacket. You know? <laughs> okay? But ultimately, it will be resolved, okay? But that's where, that's where this kind of liberalism goes. This kind of, historically, this kind of liberalism. This kind of liberalism in the Roman Empire led to the massive spread of Christianity. Because as the Christian community began to think, my God, they have standards, where did they get them? Because you didn't get them from Roman law. So where did they get them? People ask that. I have them inside me. How do you know not to kill a person? I know. There's no law against not killing a slave. The Christians didn't kill slaves. You know, so I see it as a good movement, but we will not see the end of it. Okay, we will not live to see the structuring. But it, what happens is we're gonna watch an internalization of moral structure. That's a fact. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah. You already had your turn. Well, Go I ahead. Point, but I'm concerned about the secularism. Uh -huh. We can't even teach or in public schools anything about God. Mm -hmm. How can they develop this, this conscience without yeah. the, Mm -hmm. society. I mean, it's mm -hmm. secular, and that's, I guess, my concern. Yeah. Why don't you ask Mother Teresa how you can teach the faith without laws and the ability to teach it? You know, it's, I, I just think this stuff ultimately 
will go on. We want to be very, very careful of laws that inhibit freedom because they can be used against us. You know, like for instance, I regard Scientology about as peripheral as you can get to the teachings of Jesus and still pronounce the name, okay? But I would be dead against a law against Scientology because then when they got the numbers, there'd be a law against Christianity. Okay, so the, the freedom laws are good, but we want people to build consciences. And what we do is we build them in the families, wherever we are, and ultimately, again, look at the Roman Empire. Everything was against the church, everything. Absolute freedom, the most dissipated society history's ever seen. And we brought them down. And we brought them down actually rather quickly, you know? But so I think, I just think that's, that's where that goes. If it, it's gonna be a process, but it will be a matter of people making that internal. Thank you very much. And I love that you kept it consistent and just adding on more to what it was awesome. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for me, having this, having this community here of men, yeah, that noticing that I'm not alone out there. These are men I see at mm -hmm. church, hardworking family, and mm -hmm. just hearing their story, even when we're breaking the bread stuff or afterwards. And then having this consistency because we live in a world and I'm media, YouTube, we hear a portion, a portion, which sounds great, but the consistency of you know, the cloth, the, the theme, we tie it back to the movie, tie it to our lives. Mm -hmm. It speaks a lot more, for me, it's like a lot more profound. It just gives me a lot more uh, intel, if you will, understanding, mm -hmm. instead of just little blurbs, which are great, but they're just like little commercials that you move on. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what you were speaking of earlier, is that unless we gather in groups of Christians, you think that no one thinks like you. You look at the world around and no one has standards but me. No one is interested in the future but me. No one believes in God but me. And that's one of the reasons why we gather communities. You know, I told you that the essence is to gather a community. But the reason we do that is that people know that there are people who think like us and this sort of thing. And it's not just an unusual thing. But isn't it true that you have to build family first to build community? Mm -hmm. So you have to preach to your own family. Your family is the first community, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if I would agree with you, the family is broken. I'll tell you the principal difficulty I see in American society is that you, I don't think a person comes to faith till you have a disaster in your life. You can learn how to deal with everything but a disaster. And when you have a disaster, you suddenly realize there's absolutely nothing I can do and Jesus shows up. That's the way it works, okay? But the way Americans raise their children today, we immunize them to difficulty. American children do not feel difficulty. They can smack a teacher in the classroom and their parent will come to defend them 
because my child would never possibly. So the child is protected from everything. If I ever smacked a teacher in the classroom, I'd have been afraid to go home, you know? You just, but it's a very, a very different thing now. And I think it doesn't help to protect people from problems. Human life is how you deal with problems, not the escape from them. And I think that's also why we have so many problems with drugs and alcohol. Once you get away and your parents can't protect you from the problems, sometimes the bottle does. So I think the reciprocity of gifts is something that really struck me. It's not one way. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when you look at this, it's one way. Like, I've got this gift, but you don't realize you're getting a gift back as exactly. well. And that's yeah. really struck me. That's good, yeah. They're all two-sided, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You'll notice the holes rather than the mountains. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you. I really appreciate your attention. Uh, you might think again of the gifts of two-sided. If you didn't want me to do this, I'd never exercise my gift either. <laughs>